Good morning. I want you to get your Bible and have it handy. We're going to start looking at Ephesians 6 here in just a little bit. If you will just find your place in that text. Our task this morning is to consider moving from receivers to senders. Dr. Rogers challenged all of us yesterday to think about not just receiving, but turning around and sending and challenging you, particularly as African believers, to recognize your responsibility and your privilege and your opportunity to send to the nations. So my task this morning is to think about how do we influence that process as professors, as equippers, as teachers. But I want to start with what I think is an obstacle to that whole process. I'm convinced that the sending comes out of the church. The church is the sender. The church raises up people. The church sends. Now, they may participate with other agencies that help them, uh, but the church is the, the sending agency to send out folks to the nations. Well, here's the problem with that. Many churches, as I've studied churches over the last 25 years, they, they may start with an outward focus. They start with a desire to reach people. They start with a desire to influence their community. They start with a desire to make disciples. And sometimes what happens as they add structure to what they're doing, as they add ministries to what they're doing, sometimes the same church that started with an outward focus winds up unintentionally turning inwardly. They don't mean to do that. They don't set out to turn inwardly. It's just that the process of doing all the ministry, the process of meeting one another's needs, the process of figuring out how they're going to do church, they turn their attention away from people who need to hear about Jesus and turn their attention more toward themselves. Now, that's my report from what I see in American churches. I'm making an assumption that you have similar patterns in some of your churches. Uh, you can help me out here with just nodding your head yes or no. Am I, am I speaking of issues that you might face as well? And if so, here's the issue. We want our churches to be sending churches, but sometimes we're asking churches to do that who aren't thinking outwardly at all in the first place. And so we're really asking them to make a dramatic move when they're not even in a position to start that. So what I want us to think about this morning is, as professors and educators, what is our role in helping our students and consequently then helping their churches turn outwardly again and then out of that become senders? Does that make sense? So I want to start with some foundational stuff that may be surprising to you, but I think we have to start there and then move toward what does it mean to be a sending church and consider what we must do with our students. And so uh, Dr. Bledsoe is going to raise the PowerPoint and I'm going to list some things for you that you can write in your notes if you wish, and we'll use these in our time of discussion as well. Here's number one. We must continually teach our students and by extension their church members a theology of lostness. We must, we must continually teach them a theology of lostness. Now, we know what the Word teaches. We know that we are all sinners by our nature and by our actions, separated from a holy God, destined for death and judgment. And were it not for God's intervention in our lives, we would find ourselves in eternal hell. We know this, that only through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ can we be restored to a relationship with our Creator. And the good news is, God is still about that work, drawing to Himself His own from every nation, tribe, people, and tongue that may, might worship Him around His throne. And God is still doing that business. We know, though, that we are lost apart from Jesus. We know that. We believe that truth. But our knowledge does not necessarily mean that our students 
And most certainly their church members always believe that too. Just because we believe it doesn't mean everybody that we teach believes it. Just because we believe it doesn't mean that the people that we teach, they teach others, doesn't mean that those down the line believe it. True? So, we have to continually go back to this theology of lostness to remind those that we teach, to remind ourselves of the necessity of the gospel that we must send with the folks that we send. In previous years, I required some of my doctoral students to do an anonymous survey of the theology of their church members to find out what their church members really believed. Let me give you one illustration that reminds me of this necessity. I had a student who was a long-term pastor in a church, and this student, this pastor, strongly believed in the exclusivity of the gospel. He, he preached, he taught Jesus was the only way to the Father, and we need a personal relationship with him. He taught that for years, and yet when he did this survey of his church members, what he discovered was a large number, a surprising number of his adult leaders believe that all good people go to heaven whether or not they know Jesus. And what this pastor learned is that somehow what he was teaching was not connecting with his people. It was not settling in their minds and in their hearts. And one of the reasons he did this survey was that he was pastoring a church that he could not get to do evangelism. He struggled with program after program after program, trying to get them to try to reach the lost, and nothing was working. And here's what he learned from this survey. You're not going to do much evangelism if you don't believe there's a need to do so in the first place. And that's where he found many of his, of his church members. Now, again, I may be mistaken to think that your churches may face similar issues, but but I suspect we're all in that same boat in some way. So if we really want to move receivers to senders, we need to recognize that we're not going to do much of that if the folks we lead and the folks they lead see little need to tell others about Jesus in the first place. So here's what that means for us as educators. Those of you who teach theology... Those of you in this room who teach theology, you are just as critical to the process of producing senders as are those who teach missions. And it's really this simple. A bad theology will lead to a bad missiology. And in fact, a bad theology might erase the need for a missiology at all if you don't believe there's a need to know Jesus. So, we must continually teach our students, and by extension, their church members, a theology of lostness. Here's number two. We who teach must ourselves be broken over lostness. One of our brothers mentioned this yesterday in our, in our response time, that this has to start with us. Let me tell you some of my story. I was not raised in a, in a Christian home. In fact, my parents did not become believers until my dad was 71 and my mom was 79. Uh, just over two years ago now, I had the privilege of baptizing my mom when she became a believer. Six months later, she, she went to be with the Lord. So I had six months with my mom as my sister in Christ. But I had no Christian witness in my home as I was growing up. I first heard about Christ when God, God put in my seventh grade classroom a passionate 12-year-old follower of Jesus who wanted me to know Jesus too. And he was so passionate, he made it his goal to win me to the Lord that year. And his approach was sometimes confrontive. It was obnoxious sometimes. It seemed out of control at times. It was painful at times. Because every day, he would tell me that I was going to hell if I didn't know Jesus. <laughs> every day. Some days, he would meet me at the classroom door. I'd walk in the classroom in the morning, and he would say to me, Chuck, it's a good thing you lived through the night. 
Uh, <laughs> because <laughs> because he would say you would be in hell right now if you if you hadn't. Now he had little tact, but he had a lot of truth. Now his his method may not have always been the best. But you know what? God used that message, and somewhere in the midst of that message, God drove truth into my heart and drew me to himself and made me his child. My pastor said to me, the day I became a believer, the day God changed my heart, my pastor, I didn't even know that was his title. He said, you need to go out and tell people about Jesus. And I was ready to do that. But the only way I knew how to do it was the way my friend talked to me. Uh, and so that's what I did. I was, I was equally obnoxious. And to be honest, when I first became a pastor, I was perhaps not as obnoxious, but certainly as passionate. All I knew to do as a young pastor was to preach the word of God and tell people about Jesus. And that's what we did. My church members heard that. And week after week after week, we covered our city with the gospel. And we saw God redeem people. And we had the privilege of baptizing them as an illustration of their, of their faith. And I love those days. But let me continue the story. It was easy to let ministry needs get in the way of evangelism. It was easy to let something else draw away my passion. And I had to recommit myself to make sure that I was broken over lostness and sharing the gospel with others. When I became a professor, I knew that I would have some opportunity to influence others. And I wanted, my heart wanted to, to illustrate this passion over, over lostness, this passion to share the gospel with people and the Lord helped create that in me, but I will again be honest with you. I'll again be honest with you. What I've learned is that the work of teaching, the work of being a professor, likewise can just get so busy that you can get distracted away from speaking the gospel to people who need to know Jesus. And, and we too can get so consumed with our ministry among believers that we lose our passion for non-believers. Sometimes what happens for those of us who are, who are professors, we spend our time doing discipleship in the classroom setting, and that's a great way to do discipleship. But what happens is we devote the bulk of our attention to that, and we, we lose our focus on reaching non-believers we wind up doing half of the Great Commission. And if we really want to produce senders, it had better start with those of us who teach with our own brokenness over lostness, and our students see that, sense that, hear about that, and consequently, they get some of that same passion, and when we challenge them to go to the nations, they do so because they recognize that people are lost without Jesus. How do we do that? I want to think about that practically. That's where I wanted to start in Ephesians 6. How do we regain that passion? I want to give you just a couple of ways to do that that, that are helpful to me. In Ephesians 6, verse 18 and following, the Apostle Paul calls the Ephesian believers to pray, to pray with great passion, and he, he speaks about praying for all the saints, and then he narrows the focus to requesting prayer for himself. Here's what he, what he writes. Pray at all times in the Spirit with every prayer and request, and stay alert with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. Then he says, pray also for me, that the message may be given to me when I open my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. For this, I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I might be bold enough to speak about it as I should. And so here's what Paul says. You pray for all the saints, but then I'm asking you to pray for me that I will speak the gospel boldly. 
Now go to Colossians chapter 4. Beginning in verse 2, the words are similar. We hear the same call for passionate prayer, the same call for alertness. Verse 2 says, devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us. Now, again, Paul brings it down to pray for me, pray for my team. Pray also for us that God may open a door to us for the word, to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains, so that I may make it known as I should, or that I may make it clear. And so here he says, I want you to pray for us that we will speak the gospel clearly and God will give us opportunities to do so. That's the Apostle Paul saying, I need you praying for me that way. I would suggest to you if the Apostle Paul needed prayer support to do his work, surely you and I do. And one of the ways we can regain our passion for lost people, our brokenness over lostness, is to get some folks who pray for us regularly, that we will speak the gospel boldly and clearly, and God will give us opportunities. And if we really want to be an example to our students, let's get some of our students to be those folks praying for us. And let them hold us accountable to walking through the doors of opportunity to speak the gospel to others. Another way to regain this, this brokenness. I would challenge you to always be able to name, for me, at least three to five non-believers for whom I'm praying. <coughs> Paul said, my heart's desire, my prayer for Israel is that they would be saved. I would want us to be able to fill in the blank. My heart's desire, my prayer for whoever, for this person. My desire is for that person to be saved. And I want us to be able to name them because an unnamed burden is no burden at all. It's one thing to say I'm praying for lost people. It's another thing praying I'm praying for my sister, Sherry, who is not a believer. I want us to be able to name the people for whom we're praying. And then I narrow that focus one more step. I would challenge you to always be investing in the lives of one or two non-believers. Always able to name those two persons that you're most seeking to share the gospel with. Someone's praying for you that you will be a gospel witness. You're praying for a number of people that they will hear and respond to the gospel. You're investing in a couple of people that they would hear the gospel from you and respond to that truth of, of God's word. All of those steps that we can take that, that God might restore our brokenness over lostness. He might deepen our desire for people to be saved. We might identify them by name. And then when we challenge our students to raise up churches that are cinders, we do it out of hearts, the desire for God's glory to go to the nations. Does that make sense? All right, here's number three. We must continually direct our students to the needs of the nations. We must continually direct our students to the needs of the nations. Now, here's, here's what I mean by that. Regardless of our discipline, regardless of what we teach, we have opportunity and, in my judgment, responsibility to guide our students toward the work among the nations. That is to turn them toward the call of the Great Commission. And it is in our combined efforts, all of our faculty working together in our various disciplines, that we will deepen the burdens of our students for the nations. One of our brothers mentioned yesterday that we need to develop a culture, a Great Commission culture in our institutions. You know how that happens? Every professor is broken over the lost. Every professor looks to the nations. Every professor desires for his or her students to, to see the nations before them and want them to know Jesus. So here's what I want us to think about. I want us to think about some practical ways that we as professors, as teachers, as trainers, as equippers can direct those we teach to the nations. I'm just going to give you some to think about. 
Here's one way. Have a regular classroom time of prayer for the nations. And I would go so far as to say every time you step in front of a class, you lead them to pray for the nations. Every time you're with them, you focus that prayer time perhaps on an unreached people group. Perhaps on a missionary that your students know, or a missionary that you know, or a missionary whose story you have, you have read, you have heard. Perhaps it is this. You read of the news, and you read of some tragedy in, among the nations, a war that erupts, a natural disaster that takes lives, and there are needs in those settings. And so as a class, you stop and you pray for the people in those situations. You pray for pastors ministering in those situations. You pray for families that are suffering in those situations. And as you do that, you are directing your students to the nations that you might deepen their burden. And it's simply taking time out of your class to pray. And I get it. I've been a professor for 27 years. I get it that it's tough to fit everything into our class time now. And I'm asking you to add something to that. But I'm suggesting to you Adding prayer to the nations matters. And taking the time to do that, maybe that means we have to be more concise in everything else we do, but you know what? It may not be bad if we do that either. For many of us. True? Thank you. Build the prayer time into your class every time you gather. I would want this to happen. I would want your students to be surprised if you don't lead them to pray to the nations. Here's number two. Anytime you can use a map, do it. Anytime you can use a map, do it. I don't know about your students, but I'll tell you about my students in, in, in North Carolina and realistically about North Americans, we are woefully ignorant of geography and the map. So anytime you have opportunity in your classroom to pull out a map, to put it on the screen, to remind your students that the world is bigger than where they live, there is value in doing that. You teach world literature, use a map. You teach church history, use a map. You teach about something that happens in, in the history of theological development, use a map. You teach missions, you use a map. You teach Old Testament, get the map out. You teach New Testament, get the map out. Lay an ancient map on the table. Put a contemporary map over the top. Help your students see the world. And then as you do that, point out, look, this is where that happened. Here's a need in that country among those people this day, and take a few minutes and pray for that nation. It's easy to do. We just have to do it with intentionality. Here's number three. As a professor, talk to missionaries and find out what they're dealing with on the field. Here's what that means. We as professors have to have relationships with missionaries who are serving elsewhere. And we just communicate with them and ask them, what are, what are you facing? Maybe what they're facing is materialism. Maybe it's ancestor worship. Maybe it's syncretism. Maybe it's suffering. Maybe it's neo-Pentecostalism. Maybe it's other world religions. Maybe it's the demonic. I don't know what you're going to hear, but here's my point. When we learn what missionaries are facing, we can bring that back into what we're teaching our students. So we can say to them, I was speaking with a missionary in this part of the world, and what he is facing is the growth of neo-Pentecostalism. So let's talk about what that is and why we must be prepared to deal with that. Or this missionary told me they're, they're dealing with tremendous suffering, even the believers. And so in my theology class, let's make sure we deal with the theology of suffering. And we can now lay on top of my lecture the reality that this is very relevant. And here's why I know that. A missionary has told me they're dealing with that right now as we speak. Does that make sense? Because you've got to be in communication with missionaries and you listen to them. 
and make application. Here's number four, fourth thing to do, to, to really direct our students to the needs of the nations. I would encourage you, in every class you teach, have at least one assignment that directs your students to the nations and the Great Commission. Regardless of what your discipline is. Maybe it is a research paper comparing inclusivism and exclusivism and forcing a student to look at this question, to answer this question about the, the fate of the unevangelized, those who have never heard, and helping that student come to grips with why do we believe that Jesus is the only way and a personal relationship with him is necessary. And out of that research assignment, a student learns that and is grounded in that. Maybe you direct a student to the Joshua Project website, and we ask that student to do a review of the prayer needs, the needs of the world there. What do you learn? You just list the things that you learn. Maybe in a church history class, you include missionary biographies as part of the reading. Maybe it's a scholarly analysis of missionary passages in the scripture. Maybe the assignment is preparing arguments for sharing the gospel with a wide variety of people, a European atheist, a Muslim, a Buddhist. Maybe it's an assignment to consider how to address issues of polygamy in a pagan culture. Maybe it's a theology of New Testament evangelism. Maybe the assignment is write an essay on how you would teach any of these topics in a culture that does not read. Do you get the point? I want you to think about, in all of our disciplines, we try hard enough, we can come up with some assignment that does evaluate, is the student learning what I'm teaching, but also pushes the student to think about the needs of the world. And we need to do this together as faculty. We need to talk together. We need to help each other come up with those assignments so that our students in every class they take with us, they are learning about the needs of the nations and perhaps God will grip their heart as our responsibility is to continually direct them there. Here's number four. The fourth thing we must do. We must teach our students what it means to grow a sending church. We have to talk to them about what it means to be a sending church. So here's what I want to do. I want to give you some characteristics of the sending churches that I know. And think about with you, how do we help our students move in this direction? As I look at sending churches, and I look at teaching my students what a sending church is, here's what I've seen in sending churches. First, they have pastors whose own hearts are burdened for the nations. Almost every sending church I know committed to raising up people and sending them out. Almost everyone I know has a pastor who has served on the field as a missionary or who wonders why God hasn't yet called him to the field and who gets to the field as often as he can because his heart bleeds for the nations. In fact, in all of my years of studying churches, I have never seen a strongly mission-minded church without a strongly mission-minded pastor. I just haven't seen it. A second characteristic I've seen, these sending churches have pastors who are unafraid to send out their best. And this may be the biggest obstacle. These pastors are more focused on God's kingdom than on their own kingdom. They're more concerned about magnifying the name of Jesus than they are about magnifying their own name. And they are willing to send out their most talented members, their most faithful members, their highest giving members. And there it hits the, it hits the heart, right? If that's God's plan for the spread of the gospel. They're okay with raising up and sending out their best. Another characteristic, these are pastors who regularly call out the called. 
They proclaim God's calling from the pulpit. They introduce people to the needs of the world. They challenge them to consider God's work. And they challenge them to consider the possibility of God's calling on their lives. They don't wait for people to come to them. Their eyes are always open for faithful believers who might exhibit some sense of a call. And they're unafraid to go to people individually and say, I wonder if God might be calling you to the nations. These pastors see as their responsibility, raising up, calling out, and sending out people to the nations. And then these are churches that have a strategy to develop, send, and care for the people they send. They have a pipeline of discipleship, so they're making disciples. They often partner with denominational agencies to send out their best. They regularly pray for communicate with, care for, and spend time with the people they send. So they know it's their job to care for people, particularly those they send to the nations. They have to do so from a distance, but still, they make effort to do so. If we want to be senders rather than just receivers, we must help our students evaluate their church, not so much by how many show up, but by how many go out. There's a lot of work in that, though. It's tough. It's tough to identify and challenge potential cross-cultural workers to prepare them, to get them ready, to pray for them, walk beside them, visit them. It's hard work. But if we're going to reach the nations, we have to move from being receivers to being senders. And our job is to help our students think about leading sending church. And finally, here's number five. Let me quickly go to the last thing we must do. We must teach our students to pray for the sent ones. And perhaps we need them to teach them to pray in general. Here I, I have two matters in mind. First, my experience is that many of my students struggle with prayer at all. They know they need to pray, but no one's ever taught them to pray. They often have ability, and because they have ability, that ability sometimes gets in the way of their dependence on God. So it might be that one of the first things we have to do is to teach our students to pray in general. And they will learn that, by the way, by hearing us pray by our teaching them to pray. More particularly, though, I think about what we read earlier in Ephesians 6 and Colossians 4. The Apostle Paul called for people to pray for him. He, the missionary, called for believers to pray for him that he would speak the gospel boldly and clearly. He was where, by the way, when he wrote these letters? He was in prison. For doing what? For preaching the gospel how? Boldly and clearly. Here's what Paul said. I want you all praying for me that I will keep on doing what got me here in the first place. And here's my point. The apostle knew that we're all in a spiritual battle. That's why he said recurrently, stay alert, pray for all the saints. And he knew the battle that he walked in. And he knew if he was going to do the work that God had called him to do, he would do it in the power of God on the wings of the prayers of God's people. And if we're going to send people, we're going to raise up leaders who raise up sending churches, we better teach them to continually pray for those we send. So it seems to me if we don't pray for those we send, we are sending them into a war without the support that they need. And here's how we do that. We teach our students to pray for those who are sent. So I go full circle back to where we started. Every time you gather with your students, pray for those that are sent. Pray for the nations. Model it. Teach it. Give them assignments that hold them accountable to it. That's the way we start, moving from being receivers to senders. That's how we can make a difference as professors. Got it? 
All right, here's what I want us to do. I'm going to leave these on the screen. I want you to work together in your groups. I'm just going to tell you what I want you to do. The questions themselves won't be on the screen, but you can, you can easily remember these. The, the first thing I want you to do is this. I've talked enough about praying for those we send that if we don't pray uh, for them for a minute, uh, I will be a hypocrite. And so I want us to start in our groups. You know people who have been sent. There are people in this room who are here because they have been sent. So I want you to start by taking a few minutes and just pray for some. Pray for folks you know. Do what I'm challenging you to do. Then I want you to, after you have prayed, I want you to look at this list again, and I want you to ask this question. Which, which of these areas do you most need to work on in your ministry? In your capacity as a professor, a teacher, an equipper, and a trainer, which of these do you really need to give some attention to? And then the second question, the follow-up question is this. What's one adjustment that you can make, one change that you can make to do one of these better? So where do you most need to focus and what's one change you can make? What's one thing you can do? The reason for that second question is, I don't want you to just hear things we need to do without thinking about what you might do. So I want you leaving here with, this is one thing I can do the next time I gather with my students. All right, so let's get in our groups, take some time to pray, and then after you've prayed, talk together about where you think you need to work on some things, and then what you will do. And we'll take a few minutes to hear some of your ideas.